Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, your word declares that the first and greatest commandment is for us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And a second is like unto it, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We also see in scripture that we are to love one another, even as Christ loved us. So we are to love one another, that the world may know that we belong to him. We are told to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And so, Lord, we are to be those that love the love that you have poured into our hearts, we are to pour out upon you and upon everyone else, that we would be characterized by the love of God. And so, Lord, I would ask that you would help us in this regard. For more often than not, Lord, we do not love as we ought. And so, Lord, Help us to overcome this through the fruit of the Spirit, which we see that the first fruit is love. So we ask that the Holy Spirit would help us to love and so reflect your character. Lord, we pray that you would continue to fashion us into the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to overcome the temptations of this world, that we would flee from temptation, that we might not sin against you, Lord. We ask that you would forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that as we come before you in worship, Lord, these things would not be a wall erected to keep us from you that, Lord, you might cleanse us afresh, that we might come before you boldly through the blood of Jesus Christ to worship your holy name and to give you glory and honor and praise. And so, Lord, love you in this. We ask, Lord, that you would just open our hearts to your word, that it wouldn't just penetrate our minds, but that it would shape who we are, what we are, what we do. May we truly hear your voice today, to hear from you, Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, we would pray. So direct us, Holy Spirit, we ask, that in all these things, Christ might be preeminent, that in all these things, Lord God, you would get all that is rightfully yours, that this would not be first about us, but first about you, that it would indeed be a time of worship. Help us to know today what that really is. So may we sit under your word that you would instruct us, Lord. You give us understanding, discernment, but that, Lord, you would transform us through it. Bless us, Lord, and keep us. Lord, many are going through difficult times right now and perhaps they're overwhelmed by circumstances in their lives and they're finding it hard to worship today. So I would ask a, a double portion of blessing upon them, Lord, that you would have, help them to cast their cares on you and worship you in that. And that, Lord, maybe you would speak to them in a special way today through your presence, that you would encourage them and uplift them, remind them, Lord, how much you love them and you will never leave them nor forsake them, that you are a heavenly father and you have promised good to us. So Lord, we ask now, direct us to your presence. Pull us in deep, Lord, that we might know you better. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Bible and turn to the book of Daniel. 
Daniel chapter 7. We're going to read the same scripture reading we read last week. Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 9 through the end of the chapter. Last week we read in the English Standard Version. This week I'm going to read from the New International Version. Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. The word of the Lord. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because the boastful words the horn was speaking i kept looking until the beast was slain its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire the other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time in my vision at night i looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven he approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all this. So he told me and gave me this interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the 10 horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come together, who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kings under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. In Daniel chapter 7, we noted that Daniel has a vision of different beasts and these differing beasts they represent a series of world powers, kingdoms that will come upon the earth. It parallels in many ways the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, his dream in Daniel chapter 2, in which we saw a series of kingdoms beginning with Nebuchadnezzar and the Neo-Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Grecian Empire, and then the Roman Empire. Here we have more detail concerning 
these empires and the imagery changes from various metals now to these beasts, but the parallels are unmistakable. We saw when we looked a while ago in the beginning of Daniel chapter seven, again, these series of, of empires, the Neo-Babylonian empire, then the Medo-Persian empire, and then the Grecian empire. And then we have this fourth beast, this fourth empire, the Roman Empire. And it's completely different from the others. And we see from later on in the book of Daniel and then in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Revelation, that this last empire is going to come in two stages. We're going to have what we would know as the historic Roman Empire. That began in the first century BC. And there's going to be a future phase of this kingdom. And we know this because the kingdom of God will break into the world scene and destroy this kingdom at the second coming of Christ. Now, this is a premillennial understanding, which is different from an all millennial. Uh, understanding which sees that the kingdom is now in effect and these things in many ways have already been fulfilled in the past most of them would argue that these things were fulfilled in the time of christ but i think it is by far more persuasive to see a future uh, fulfillment from the pre-millennial perspective as even uh, john the apostle in the book of revelation describes these events as future events from his time point writing in approximately AD 95. So they're not past events, but future events, and even future from our perspective. Now, what captures Daniel's uh, imagination here and his attention is primarily this fourth kingdom, which is described as being different from the rest. He says in verse 7, after that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the form, former beasts, and it had ten horns. This seems to be paralleling the feet and toes of iron and clay in Daniel chapter 2. Now, we're not told that there are 10 toes there. We can assume that there are 10 toes. And the book of Revelation will make it clear that this is a future a kingdom because it's going to pick up on the 10 horns there as well, which represent 10 kings. But he, he notices that it's different. It's a ruthless kingdom, which fits very well with the historic uh, Roman Empire, which was known for how ruthless it was in crushing uh, all that opposed it. Um, the Grecian Empire, which some scholars have tried to make the Fourth Empire the, the Grecian Empire, didn't work like this. Uh, Alexander the Great sought to conquer by uh, just swiftly overwhelming and trying to leave mostly intact whereas the Roman Empire sought to crush and destroy. And uh, so this is the Roman Empire. And he says, while I was thinking, this is verse 8, about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, it was mentioned last time and in our previous time of looking at Daniel chapter 7 that this is a reference to the individual known as the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, uh, the little horn that comes from this empire. This is a future ruler who will come upon the earth um, in the time of the tribulation period. And he is described here as the little horn. And it says here concerning him, he came up among them, that is among the 10 horns. So he is an 11th horn that comes up 
in the midst of this described as little, but ultimately he is the one who will um, remove, he'll literally uh, pluck out three others as he uh, assumes control in the book of Revelation, as we'll read in a few minutes, actually says that these other ones will actually give their power and authority to uh, this individual. The, so the timing described here is the second coming of Christ. It's at the very end before Christ establishes his kingdom upon the earth. And the Ancient of Days, God the Father ascends first with the angels. And then it says, one like the Son of Man descended. And this is a reference to the second coming of Christ, which we are told about in Revelation chapter 19. Now, we went through the details of the court being set up. Really, there's one judge that is the Ancient of Days. He comes and he offers the kingdom to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he, the one like the son of man, is given the kingdom and worship, which tells us not only is he a human being, because he's described as one like the son of man, he is the, the heir of the throne of David in fulfillment of the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He is also God because he receives worship. And we know that God will not share his glory with another, only God is to be worshipped, and yet this one here, we are told, is to be worshipped. He is given worship and a kingdom that will never end. Now, if we pick up now in verse 15, Daniel says that he was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. I approached one of those standing there and asked him the true meaning of all of this. So he told me, and gave me the interpretation of these things. The four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth, but the saints of the most high will receive the kingdom. So this is believers. This is believers. We are told in Daniel here and elsewhere that only believers will enter into the kingdom. We're going to see from Revelation chapter 19, and we looked at uh, Matthew chapter 25 last time, that at the second coming of Christ, he is coming in judgment and to establish his kingdom. And when he comes, we saw in Matthew 25, the, the sheep goats judgment, that those who belong to him, the believers, the sheep, enter into the kingdom, but the goats, those who do not belong to him, those unbelievers it said there that they will be cast into the eternal fire they will be killed and they will be thrown into into hell and this is at the second coming of christ and so daniel asks about these these things concerning these four beasts and we're told that the saints of the most high believers are going to enter into that kingdom now according to the book of revelation and other prophetic passages we're going to have two types of of believers that are going to be in in the kingdom you're going to have those in their natural earthly bodies those who are the sheep who are are to possess the kingdom at the second coming but also the believers that are in their eternal glorified bodies that come with christ to reign upon the earth so we're going to have those saints in their natural bodies and those in their resurrected glorified bodies who will come with christ to rule and reign with him so daniel uh, talks about this then verse 19 says then i wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast which was different from all the others and most terrifying with its iron teeth and bronze claws the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up before me, which three of them fell, uh, and the horn that took more imposing, looked more imposing than the others, and that had eyes and a mouth to speak boastfully. So again, here we've seen about this idea of how boastful this this 
this uh, little horn is, the Antichrist. We saw this in verse 8. Uh, while I was there thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And then it says that he had the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Verse 11 said concerning him. Then I continue to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. And then we see it here in verse 20 again. Uh, he had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I watched this, uh, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. So this, again, is during the tribulation period where he is going to persecute Christians. And we're going to read in uh, Revelation chapter 13 and chapter 17 uh, some of the details of what's going to go on during this period of time. And hopefully it'll bring uh, more clarity to, to what's going on. But we'll, we'll come back. We'll work our way through Daniel here, and then we'll supplement it by looking at uh, Revelation 13 and 17, and to some extent, uh, chapter 19. So he is waging war against the saints and defeating them <clears throat> until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on the earth it will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth trampling it down and crushing it now the roman empire didn't occupy the whole earth um, of the four historical kingdoms the medo persian uh, the the uh, before that the neo babylonian uh, the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire. Of these four, the Roman Empire wasn't even the largest of these empires. But the future phase of it seems to be a global empire. And it will consume for all ten intents and purposes the entire earth. So it's going to trample down and crush it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, by the way, this language implies that these ten are going to be contemporaneous, as does the whole idea that he comes up amongst them, plucking out three of them. And this is even reinforced in the book of Revelation, which makes it even clearer that these ten are at the same time in this future kingdom, which there is no historical referent to, their, uh, to this being fulfilled at all. Um, especially in the Roman Empire. So the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High. Now here again, we have this um, fourth reference, really, in Daniel 7 of the boastful, blasphemous, arrogant words of this individual. And it's interesting when he says here that he would uh, speak against the Most High. Now, this is interesting because one Old Testament scholar, uh, Leon Wood, says that the word for against is literally at the side of indicating that the little horn will seek to raise himself as high as God and make pronouncements accordingly. And so this isn't your, your run-of-the-mill blasphemy, but this individual, this antichrist, is actually setting himself up as God. Now, other passages make this crystal clear, but I think that there is an interesting parallel going on. I'm going to see in Revelation that Satan puts all his power and malice and, and evil into this individual so that he's almost an incarnation of the devil. Well, what's the devil like? Well, in Isaiah chapter 14, we see that... Uh, the, the devil 
what is his ultimate gain? His ultimate gain is that he wants to receive the worship that is rightfully belonging to God. He wants to be acknowledged in worship. Now, you remember what he said when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. All the kingdoms of the earth I will gladly give to you if you will fall down and worship me. This is what Satan ultimately wants. He wants to be worshipped. He wants to be treated as God. And we see this in the description of his fall in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14 says this. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. The stars of God, there's a reference to the angels. I will sit enthroned on the Mount of Assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Satan desires to be treated as though he is God. He wants to be worshipped. And this uh, incarnation of sorts of Satan in the Antichrist, well, He's going to take on the nature of the devil in his desire for worship. He wants to be worshipped. If we talk about power, the ultimate power grab is to be worshipped. It is one thing to have all of the world acknowledge that you are the supreme ruler. It's another thing to be worshipped as God. And that's ultimately what he wants. And that's ultimately what he's about. And we see this very clearly in the book of Revelation and elsewhere. For instance, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, we read this. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 4. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our, 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 and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy re report or letter supposed to have come from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. In other words, the, the timing of the tribulation period commences with uh, the the antichrist being revealed when he he begins to move on the earth um the man of doom to the man doomed to destruction now notice verse four here he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called god or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in god's temple proclaiming himself to be god He wants to be worshipped, and he will orchestrate events to make sure that he is worshipped. And so this is how he ultimately will be against God. He's going to set himself up to be worshipped. And so we read again concerning him that he will speak. This is Daniel 7.25. He will speak against God and oppress his saints. So part of his mission is to attack believers. And this is one of the things that Satan wants to do. He wants to be worshipped, and he hates when people worship the true and living God, because that reminds him that he is not God, and that he is not receiving what is rightfully God's, and he stands opposed to God. And he stands opposed to any who would give glory to God. And so he hates the saints of God. He hates the people of God because they worship the true and living God. And they promote truth 
and the worship of the true and living God. Then it says, and try to change the set times and laws. Now, there is a bewildering amount of interpretation on this. Some have said that he's going to try to change the calendar during the, the French Revolution. There was, a, there was a time where they tried to change the, the work week to a 10-day week. And so some think that something like this is going to happen or the religious calendar is going to be changed and, 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 and a whole bunch of other things. More recent scholars are suggesting, and I think this, this may be a better interpretation, and it doesn't eliminate that, that they may not change uh, religious calendars in that, but really what it means is that they are going to uh, somehow change things so that it makes it very, very difficult for believers to worship God. So whether it's trying to close down churches or limit what can be said in churches or, or what can be done uh, in churches, it's a, it's a type of cancel culture upon, upon the church. And, and, and upon uh, what religions can do. And so how that's done is not exactly clear, but it certainly seems that what he is opposing is the worship uh, of the true and living God and how that can be done, where that's gonna be done. And so the, the, the number one element here is about religious persecution and primarily upon uh, true believers. And so he's going to try to change the set times and laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. Now, this is uh, three and a half times. Now, if we go back to the Daniel chapter four, it seems there that time is a reference to um, years. And it works also later on in Daniel chapter nine. So this seems to be three and a half years. Elsewhere, we're going to see that it's described in 42 months, which is three, uh, three and a half years, and also even the number of days for this period of time. And so he's going to, for uh, a time, times, and half a time, uh, the word times there, even though it's plural, is perhaps a reference to what is in, in Aramaic or in Hebrew known as a dual, so it refers, references two. Um, so this would be one plus two plus a half, so three and a half, and it fits best with three and a half years, which all also coincides with what we're told in the book of Revelation. And this would be what's known as the Great Tribulation, the second half of the tribulation period, which is coincides with the time in which the Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped, where we have the false prophet at work, uh, the mark of the beast at work, and so we see massive uh, religious persecution that's going to, to happen during this period of time. Now, let's move over before we get to 26, which is when the intervention of God happens. Turn to Revelation chapter 13. We're just going to read... Um, some verses there, but in Revelation chapter 13, John giving us a future perspective from his time. So this isn't uh, something, his, uh, a historical past from his perspective, but future perspective. And he tells us about uh, this beast who would coincide with the Antichrist in Revelation 13, beginning at verse 1. And I saw a bee, beast coming out of the sea. He had 10 horns, notice that, 10 horns, and seven heads with 10 crowns on his, on his horns, and on each of them a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. So here, here is when I was referring to that somewhat incarnation. Concerning this individual, the, the Antichrist, it said that the, the dragon, who the book of Revelation tells us is the devil and Satan himself, gave him his power, his throne, and his authority. On one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men 
worship the dragon because he had given authority. So the devil is in his glory right now because he's getting what he wants, worship. And it's a vicarious worship because he's getting it through the worship and the exaltation of the beast, the Antichrist. Men worship the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and ask, who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? Now, there's another beast that comes who is the false prophet. So he's the religious propagandist uh, that's going to be helping the Antichrist during this, this period of time in, in the second half, primarily of the, the tribulation period. And notice what he does in Revelation 13, beginning at verse 14. Because of the signs, this is what the, the, uh, the, uh, the false prophet, he was able to do miracles and, and these sorts of things. Um, it says here concerning, because he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that's an image of the Antichrist, so that it could speak and cause all who refuse to worship the image to be killed. So they're commanding people to worship this idol, which represents the beast. So it's beast worship, Antichrist worship. So in Revelation chapter 13, again, we see these 10 horns, which are future. They weren't fulfilled during what we would known as the historic Roman Empire, but in a future phase of this Roman Empire that will be in existence at the second coming of Christ, when the kingdom is established upon the earth. Now, it said here concerning um, this, this, uh, this beast, the Antichrist in, in Revelation 13, about what he's going to do, that he's going to sub, sub, uh, subdue these other kings. And it said that these, these kings actually gave their authority over to the beast. Okay, this is, this is what we are, we are going to see. Here, uh, more specifically in chapter 17, but he's going to be set up in such a way that he takes preeminence because all the power and, and uh, dominion and authority of, the, of Satan is put into him, and he's going to be, he's going to be worshipped. If you go over to chapter 17 now, it says, in beginning at verse 1, one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, come, I will show you uh, the punishment of the great prostitute or heartlet who sits on many waters. Uh, with her, the kings of the earth committed adultery and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. This, this woman represents... A false religion that is going to be used in order to promote uh, the devil's agenda and ultimately the Antichrist's agenda until the Antichrist turns on her to establish uh, the adulterous uh, worship of the beast himself. Then the angel uh, carried me away in the spirit into a desert. Then I saw a woman sitting on, on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and 10 horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, mystery of Babylon, the great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of uh, those who bore testimony to the Jesus, to Jesus. So this, this false religion, this apostate religion, part of its propaganda is to persecute and ultimately martyr true believers. 
When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. And the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which notice, by the way, she's riding the beast, which suggests at the beginning that this false religion is going to be in control of Antichrist. And then things are going to quick, quickly flip. The beast which you saw once was, now is, and will come out of the abyss and go to his destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the books of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Okay, some think that this is a reference uh, to, to Rome. Um, the five have fallen one is and one and the other is not yet come but when it does come he must remain for a little while the beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king he belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom so again this is something in the future they have not yet received a kingdom and again they're contemporaneous because it says here, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast, the Antichrist. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords, king of kings, and with him uh, will be his called chosen and faithful followers now go back to daniel chapter seven in daniel chapter seven if we come back to the setting up of the court now remember in daniel chapter seven beginning at verse nine he says thrones were set in place the ancient of days took his seat and then it says here about the court was seated and the books were opened. So then Daniel goes back in time to the events that led up to the court being in session. And then he's going to come back to it in verse 26. But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Now, we already saw that in Daniel chapter 7. Because it already said in verse 11, then I continue to watch because of the boastful words of the horn that he was speaking. I kept looking till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. So we come back to that event in verse 26. So uh, his, his power and all of that the kingdoms of men are represented in in uh, those beasts and in the, the statue in Daniel chapter 2, all that comes to an end with this judgment that comes upon them. They are destroyed forever. Now, before we get into verse 7, where it's the handing it over, what we would see here is what we read in Matthew chapter 25 last time, the sheep goats judgment. So we see that, that the beast is destroyed and cast into, but, and his kingdom comes to an end through the sheep goat's judgment. We also see this, though, in Daniel, or sorry, in Revelation chapter 19. So if you look there, Daniel, or Revelation 19, beginning at verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. So at the second coming of Christ, he comes to bring judgment and war against all those who oppose him. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, 
white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. So notice here again, the first time Christ came, he came in order to bring redemption and salvation and peace, peace with God, to be reconciled with God. The second time he doesn't come in peace. Now you remember John 3, uh, 17 says that um, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world may be saved through him. At his second coming, he does come to bring condemnation, and he comes with all the wrath of God. It says here that he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried out in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, come and gather together for the great supper of God so that you may eat the flesh of the king's generals, mighty men and of horses and their riders and the flesh of all the people, free and slave, small and great. All the people, all the unbelievers at the time of Christ's second coming are going to be killed. If you don't believe me, wait till we get to the end here. Now, of the little horn, his destruction that we read about in Daniel 7. When I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, this is Revelation 19, 19, and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these great signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Well, here's his destruction. They are thrown into the lake of fire. The rest of them, so the rest of humanity, the rest of unbelievers who have gathered with and under Antichrist, it says here, the rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This is the judgment that happens, the sheep goats judgment that happens at the second coming of Christ. So the redeemed, the sheep, enter into the kingdom along with. The, the believers who come with Christ from heaven to possess the kingdom as well, they'll enter in, but everybody else is destroyed. They're killed. The Antichrist and the false prophet, they go to the lake of fire. All the rest go to Hades. They will go into the lake of fire after they are resurrected at the end of the millennial kingdom in Revelation chapter 20, which tells us that then the great white throne judgment and anyone whose name wasn't found in the Lamb's book of life, then they were cast into the lake of fire then. So the first two occupants of the lake of fire are the Antichrist and the false prophet. And then we're going to see that it's Satan and his demons. And then at the great white throne judgment, all unbelievers are resurrected they are given their eternal bodies, and then they are cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. Okay, let's finish off here with Daniel chapter 7. Verse 27, then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints. Ultimately, they're handed over to Christ Messiah, but they are the ones who are the uh, inhabitants of the kingdom. They are the ones who get to possess it because they are given the right and the privilege to enter into this kingdom over whom the Davidic Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign, and it will be a worldwide kingdom. Okay, so 
the whole heaven will be uh, handed over to the saints. In Daniel chapter 2, we saw with the inbreaking of this kingdom, all the previous kingdoms are utterly and completely destroyed. They come to an end. Uh, they, they turn into like a, a chaff that the wind blows away and they are no more. They are forgotten. Uh, they, they cease to uh, exist. And Christ will possess the kingdom. Now, the book of Revelation and other scriptures tells us this is going to come in two phases. There's going to be uh, the millennial kingdom phase of it, which is the thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth. And then the eternal phase of it, uh, which is when it goes into the new heavens and the new earth, the eternal state. So there are two phases to, uh, to this kingdom that will be possessed forever and ever. Okay, so his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. Verse 28, this is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. Now, we have the perspective of knowing the rest of scripture. Daniel didn't. He didn't know what was going on. He knew some of the details, but he also knew that for his people, it was going to get ugly before the kingdom came. And so there was a lot of horrific things that were going to come as Daniel, who is now living in the Medo-Persian Empire, knows that there is still the remainder of the Medo-Persian Empire. And then there was going to be another empire after that, followed by another empire after that, before the coming of the final empire, the empire of Messiah was going to come. And so he knew that there was going to be a lot of suffering and pain for his people before the end would come. And uh, we live in this, this time of before the coming of Christ, this time of uncertainty. We are still under this, this, this evil empire of sinful humans that are seeking to oppose God. And we live in the midst of this and we need to be those who are found faithful. And we need to be those who are encouraged because we know how it ends. We know how it ends. And no matter what the world seems to look like, Christians should never despair because we know that God wins. And we know that because we belong to God, we are his children, we win. Remember, Jesus said, fear not, I have already overcome the world. The victory is guaranteed. God cannot lose. That is a fact. God cannot lose. And so take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. And if we are in Christ, we know that we are on the winning side. We belong to God. Nothing can change that. And we are now, because of Christ, more than conquerors. And so the days of head might be rough. They might get really rough. And some of us might be persecuted. Some of us might be martyred for our faith. But know that that's just the beginning because our eternity is secure in Jesus Christ. We are in his hand. And all that are his are not only in his hand, but in the father's hand. And no one can overcome the father. Jesus said, I know my sheep. I give them present possession, eternal life, and none of them will be lost. And so if you're in Christ today, you ultimately have nothing to fear. We don't need to be afraid of today. We don't need to be afraid of tomorrow because we are in God's hands. And he has ordained the future. He cannot be defeated. Remember, there is only one God. He is God. Apart from him, there is no God. He alone is infinite in power, in wisdom, in knowledge. He cannot be overcome. He cannot be defeated. It doesn't matter how many the devil has on his side, how many fallen angels he has on his side, how many sinful humans has on his side. Their, their total strength and power is as nothing compared to God. It is a drop in the ocean. God cannot be opposed. And so, friends, don't be afraid. Of the future. God knows the future. God knows our today. He knows our tomorrow. He knows it all. He is sovereign. He is on the throne. 
Satan is not on the throne. God is. And Satan is going to try to convince us of uncertainty. He, he's going to try to convince us that, that things are unsettling and uncertain. They're not. God is sovereign. We can trust in him. And so it's a wonderful thing that scripture has told us how the story is going to end. Hasn't told us everything we want to know, but it's told us the end and ultimately tells us God who wins, God wins, and those who belong to God wins, and those who oppose, oppose God are going to be judged. God wins. And so what is our response? Well, one, glorify God, worship God for who he is and for the fact that he is shone his love into our hearts that we might know him through his son and receive the forgiveness of sins that we may, might become his children adopted through faith in jesus christ but also remember that this world is spiraling down it is and god is sovereign over that he told us that before christ comes it would be like the days of noah it's not going to get better it's going to get worse there may be ups and downs. There may be a time in our near future where things get much better. But ultimately, things are going to spiral out of control. But God is not out of control. And so trust in God. And also remember, though, when Christ comes, he comes to judge the world. And there will be no more opportunity. And so let us be out there sharing the gospel with people so that they might know the truth that we might warn them to flee from the wrath to come, the wrath of the Lamb. There is much work for us to be doing. There are people that need to be warned, and we have been charged to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us in the dark, but you have told us in your word that you win, that you are sovereign. And everything is working to your intended purposes. You cannot be stopped. You cannot be thwarted. You cannot be sidetracked. You are in complete control. Always have been, always will be. It cannot be otherwise. And so, Lord, may we not lose heart. But to recognize, Lord, that all these things are unfolding according to your set purposes. The devil cannot do anything beyond what you permit, nor can the Antichrist, nor can this evil world. And so whatever we would go through, Lord, may we remember that all suffering and sorrow is light and momentary compared to that which awaits us. And so may we be firmly anchored to the rock of Jesus Christ. And when the storms come, Lord, we would not be moved. So, Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom and discernment and give us faith, Lord, that we might endure to the end. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.